Welcome to Imagine Wealth Without Risk, the podcast that guides you to fulfilling your dreams through guaranteed, secure investing. Here's your host, Ted Thomas. Hi, everyone. This is Ted Thomas, and welcome back to another episode of Imagine Wealth Without Risk. Now, this is all about tax lien certificates and tax defaulted property. Now, I'll have some other guests later on. First of all, I'll bring on one of the coaches and we'll do a question and answer thing that you'll enjoy as you drive along and listen. And after that, we'll move to an expert. I try to finish up each one of my podcasts with an expert, and this will be Brian Fouts, F-O-U-T-S. And he has an unusual company. He's an information marketer, and boy, he's a go-getter. He's gone from being a construction worker to a very successful entrepreneur. I'm not going to steal all his thunder, but he'll be on a little later on. So let's talk about tax lien certificates and tax defaulted property or tax deeds. Okay. All right. Now, everyone loves tax lien certificates. And why do they like those? Because they're such a good investment and you don't have to worry because you invest with the government and you get a check back from the government and you get some really outstanding rates of return, 16, 18, 24%. So that's a, a really good investment. Now there's another side to the business that's called tax deeds. And we just come up with these names, tax deeds and whatever. There's no specific book that says it's that, but what, it re- what a tax deed really is, it means that someone has defaulted on their taxes, someone that owns a property like a home or an office building, a ranch or any uh, taxable property, they've defaulted. So now it becomes a tax defaulted property. And what the local government will do is they'll uh, have a real challenge and we'll go to the challenge in a minute. They have a challenge. So what they do is they say, all right, this individual property owner has not paid us. So they send them many notices. Now that's called due process of law. So those are like registered letters. They send the letter on and say, you have to pay your taxes by a certain day in this amount, or we're going to confiscate your property. Now confiscate means they're going to seize it. They're going to take it away from you and put you, they're going to make you abandon their property. The government's going to seize the property. Now they really don't want any more property. They've got enough property. They already own the libraries and the schools and the roads and all. So they don't want property. So they're going to put that property back into the marketplace. And the way they do that, they hold an auction. And that's called a tax defaulted auction or a tax deed auction. So I think tax deed, tax defaulted, that's synonymous. Those two words meaning the same thing on the street, not in the legal courtroom. That's how we say. So I went to a tax deed auction. That means you went and tried to buy a tax defaulted auction. All right, so you get the idea. Now, think globally for a minute because the guy uh, in the street, and that might be the average person, uh, doesn't really understand all these concepts. So I'll try to make them as simple as possible. But if this is all new to you, you're going to say, this is unbelievable. So let me give you a little background on that. Now, where do I get my information? First of all, I've been at this since 1989, and I've learned uh, by doing it. I'm an author, a publisher, but more than anything, I'm doing what you want to do. I'm an investor, so I'm either going to be buying tax lien certificates, so I'm really qualified to advise you there, and I'm going to buy tax defaulted property, so I'm going to be able to advise you there. But that's only going to be from a perspective of what you might call a tradesman or an experienced person, or in, in, in my case, I do write about it and I teach about it, so I've become an author and a publisher. All right, so the average person doesn't know about these properties, but I will say, and you'll hear me say on a regular basis, you can buy these tax defaulted properties for 10 cents, 20 cents, 30 cents on the dollar. You can pay anything you want. You can pay hundreds of cents on the dollar if you want it, but you can get these properties so cheap that it, it's just amazing. Now, you will see, if you stay with me on these podcasts, I will have students and they'll tell you they bought for six cents or seven cents on the dollar. You say, oh, it can't be. But it is because the local government, they're not interested in owning any more property. In most cases, they just want to seize the property. Then they want to put it back in the marketplace. Now, why do they want to put it back in the marketplace? Because number one, they need the tax dollars. All right. And number two, They want to get it back in the marketplace because then next year it'll have tax again and tax again. 
So they're charging taxes on all of these local properties so they can pay the firemen and so they can pay the police department. And we have school teachers in the counties that have to be paid and uh, maintenance on the schools and the maintenance on the road and some money for the hospitals for the people that can't afford the hospital and some money for the libraries. And, and there's all kinds of things that the county's paying for. So the county desperately needs money and that money comes from the property within the county. So this is the number one tax. It's a tax that's always been around since uh, the founding fathers started the country. It's before income tax, it's before sales tax, it's before value added tax. Whatever tax you can think of, the first tax is always gonna be the property tax. Okay, so the concept is very simple. If you don't pay your tax, the local government's gonna take the property and they're gonna resell it. Now they do that in every state. Now about half of the states are very benevolent. By that, I mean, they'll issue a tax lien certificate. All right, now a tax lien certificate is just a piece of paper. You can buy it and pay someone else's taxes when you buy it. All right, then when that person comes in to pay, they have to pay all of the tax plus that outrageous interest rate that was charged to you of 16 or 18 or 24%. So you're getting the idea here. So here's what's going on. The local government has this challenge every single year. So I don't know where you are. You might be in Pennsylvania listening or Portland, Maine or Chicago or San Diego. I don't know where you are, but every county will have taxes. And in some places they're benevolent, so they have a tax lien certificate. In other states, they're not so benevolent. So what they do is they issue a notice and then they confiscate the property. So it's gonna be one or the other. And as we get into this, I'll give you some hybrids of, you, of how you can make money in all cases. So across the United States, and just put a round number in your mind right now, you don't have to write this down, and I'm not going to give you a test on it, but round numbers, there's 100 million taxable properties in the United States. Now think about how much money is flowing from 100 million properties into county governments. It's a lot of money. All right, so the abundance is that a certain percentage of the 100 million property owners will have something go wrong in their life. I don't know what could go wrong. Uh, they could end up in bankruptcy. They could end up with a divorce. They could end up with a, a crisis where they had a son that was sick and they put him in the hospital. They had to pay the hospital. They'd do that before they paid the taxes. So there could be hundreds of things that could happen. All right, so there's 100 million properties. Now think about this. About 2%, round numbers now, 2% property owners will default. 2% of 100 million, that's 2 million defaulted properties every year. Now, if that isn't enough for you, I'm going to tell you it's enough for the rest of us. That means there's going to be 2 million opportunities for us to either get involved in a tax lien certificate or a tax defaulted property. Wow. All right. Now, everything is um, done in a written form somewhere. And you can look stuff up and, and research it. So uh, you already have a computer at home. So you could go to your county and go into the county records and search around. Uh, now, if you don't know how to do that, uh, stay on the podcast. We'll get you that. But uh, it's always pretty easy. If you have questions, you can just go to um, – uh, I have a site for that. You can go to info, I-N-F-O, at tedthomas.com and uh, just type in your question and send it. And, you know, look in about 24 or 48 hours and there'll be an answer there. We always give you answers. And uh, we have, you know, databases full of answers. But if you've got a question that comes to mind uh, and you remember it after you've been uh, listening to a podcast, I'm happy to answer that. So just know that you can go to info at tedthomas.com anytime you want. And you'll hear a pretty voice come on from time to time. Linda will tell you that. And Lance will tell you that. Just reminders. All right. So now where were we? We talked about tax liens and tax default of property. Now, Here's where the money is, is in these tax defaulted property. Not that it's bad to buy those tax liens, because what if you could earn 18% on your money? That's a pretty good rate of return. That's a real good rate of return. All right, so now let's get to, into the nitty gritty of these tax defaulted property. So let's use simple examples, because you're driving a car or doing something right now, and I don't want to make it too complicated. So let's say that houses in the neighborhood are worth 100000 Now, I know that in the United States, the average is almost up to 300000 But let's use 100000 because it's easy. All right. Every property is going to have a tax. 
And let's say this individual doesn't pay their tax one year and they get a lot of notes and say, hey, you got to pay your tax. But the government's kind of easy on them. And they go into the second year and they say, look, you didn't pay last year and now you owe this year. You owed us 2000 bucks for last year and now you owe us 2500 And they keep sending notices. And finally, after about two years, they say, look, enough is enough. You haven't paid your bills. Now, I'm not being very specific now for a reason, because every one of the counties is going to word it a little bit differently than I did. I'm just doing it for example right now so you get it. All right, so now there was, oh, let's say $4,000 due on this house. So they put it up for auction, except simultaneously, they're going to put up all the other ones in that county. What if you live with a county that had a million people? That might be 50 or 100. Now, I've seen counties and I've gone to auction where there's 300. I've been in Los Angeles at an auction where there was 2,000 properties. Can you imagine 2,000 properties are going to go up for auction? This is going to be a whole challenge. How, are you going to know, how do you know which one to pick? So a quick review. Property's worth about 100000 It's now got about $4,000 worth of taxes, and the county has lost patience. So they'll say, all right, you haven't paid us, so guess what? We're going to sell you a property at auction. And by darn, they do it. And when they do that, they notify everybody that had an interest in the property. So you had an interest in it because you were the owner, but you probably had a loan on the property. Maybe it was Bank of America or Chase or, I don't know, your local bank, the Bank of uh, Waterloo. And so they send you a notice that they're going to foreclose and they're going to confiscate and they send the Bank of Waterloo. Now, the easiest way to stop a tax auction is pay the taxes. What could be simpler? Let me say that again. You want to stop a tax auction? Pay the taxes. And then you start over again. All right. So they send the bank, but sometimes the bank doesn't pay any attention to those registered or certified letters. So everybody that ever sends a certified letter thinks, oh, post office delivers that. People have to sign for it. No. The post office tries to deliver it. People don't answer the door. Or they take it to the bank. The bank answers the door. But the intern who just started working from junior college or the local college, so I don't know what this is. I'll just put it in the drawer if someone asks about it. Great. Nobody knows. So next thing, there's an auction. The banker doesn't show up. The property owner doesn't show up. But you do. Wow. $100,000 property. Starting bids 4000 What are you willing to pay? I know what you're willing to pay. You're willing to pay 4000 The heck with you. I'm going to pay 10000 right out of the chute. 10 cents on the dollar. Ha, you only showed up at 4,000. Guess who gets the property? Ted does, because I was there and ready and prepared at the auction. Now, seriously thinking, there's probably going to be someone else there that was smart too, and they're probably going to outbid me, and I won't get it either, because a lot of people will bid more than I do. So maybe I bid 10, they could have bid 12, and then it's just a regular auction. So you get the idea. So the point is, a $100,000 property is going to get the government's going to start out, in most cases, the government's going to start out at the back taxes on that auction because what they want out of the property is the taxes. They don't want the property. So if you'll buy it, now they're done with it. They got their money. Are they happy? They're real happy because they got their money and this new buyer has to start paying taxes. Wow. They accomplished two things. One, they got their money. Two, they got the property back on the tax roll. All right, so the local government's happy. Now, you're going to be real happy, too, if you bought a property for 10 cents, 20 cents. Who knows? I don't know. Maybe you'll pay 30 or 40 cents. Now, why don't I pay more than those? I always tell my clients, don't bid much over 20%. Because what I don't want to do, and maybe you do, I'm going to tell you not to, but maybe you do, you want to go fix it up and then really make it and get a big profit. And I get that because everybody's doing the same thing. They're all watching those fixer-upper shows on television. Now, the quicker you stop watching those shows, the better for you because it gives you the wrong perspective. Those guys are creating a television show for entertainment. They're not creating a property that's going to make a big profit. If you add up all the numbers and look at what they're doing, those are marginal deals, uh, and they're putting up huge amounts of money to do these rehabilitations and so on. All right, so am I here to knock a television show? No, but... You got to get a perspective on life, and that's television is not the perspective of life that you need. So there's going to be 100 million properties in the United States for the rest of your life or more. 2% of those are going to come up for these auctions. Some of the auctions will be tax lien certificates. Now, I like that. 
Okay, some of them will be tax deeds or tax defaulted property. Okay, you can buy either. This business is profitable on both sides. So let me talk quickly about the fixer upper business before I basically run out of time. All right, so here's the concern. With fixer upper properties, people buy those because they want to flip them. All right, depending upon who you're listening to on those flippers, if you check with Core Logic, that's our research firm. Last year, Guys that flipped houses made 9%. 9% on a flipper. Oh, my goodness. Folks, you can buy a tax lien certificate and make 18%. Why would you want to buy something, fix it up months after months, clean it up, paint it up, fix the roof, fix the plumbing, fix this, fix that, put up a whole bunch more money into it, and end up with 9%? You wouldn't want to do that. Okay, my name is Ted Thomas, and I'm going to invite you back. We're going to change paces a little bit. Remember, if you have questions, go to info at tedthomas.com. I'm always happy to answer those. I have a other website. It's called tedthomaspodcast.com. So you can head over there, and there's all sorts of other ways to connect with me. So let me give you that one again, tedthomaspodcast.com. Right now, we're going to switch over, and you're going to hear from one of my coaches. And my goodness, you're going to be surprised. Why? Because this guy buys properties for $200. So stay tuned. Here I go. See you in a few minutes. Hi, everyone. This is Ted Thomas, and welcome to the podcast. We're all very fortunate today because I have a real professional on the telephone with me. His name is Bob Schumacher, and Bob and I go back for many years, and he's not only a professional buyer of tax defaulted properties, and he's also a professional seller, and he knows a lot about how to do this in an IRA, which most people are totally confused, but he's been doing that for well over 10 years. And he has experience with tax liens and with tax deeds. So I can rave on about him for hours because uh, he deserves all that. But you're going you're gonna to hear some real words of wisdom over the next 30 minutes or so that we're together on this call. So Bob, are you on there? Can you hear me okay? Uh, I hear you're fine, Ted. Okay. Welcome to the call. And can you just start out and tell us a little bit about yourself? And it's okay to brag a little bit because they're all friends on the call and they'd like to know who you are and where you live and just some uh, pertinent things that you like to tell people about. Ted, I've lived in quite a few places. Right now I live in Macon, Georgia, and I've lived here for uh, going on 20 years. So I'm pretty well established. And likewise, I've been doing tax deeds for about the same length of time. My True background, I guess you'd say, is in forestry. That's what I went to college for at the University of Missouri. Got my degree and had a succession of jobs. Each one was you know, 12 or so years in term. So I, I was never the person to jump around from place to place. But back in the early days, when I was a lot younger, your typical job would be to work for one of the big timber companies and maybe manage some of their land. And so you have your own little kingdom and manage a bunch of land and have people working with you, supervising people, overseeing planting trees, a lot of different variety there. But those jobs have pretty much all gone away. I got laid off from that job and I saw the handwriting on the wall and I went to the consulting side of life. First as a, an employee of a, of a small consulting firm and then later on went into business for myself. And so I'm a freelancer now. I can work part-time at the forestry business and I can dedicate however much time I need to to the real estate side of things and specifically going to tax sales and maintaining the properties that I have, buying and selling and maintaining. And the first thought that came to my mind is, wow, someone went to school and they actually did what they learned in school. <laughs> You're that guy. <laughs> and nowadays, everybody goes, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do when I graduate. Oh, my goodness. You really knew what you're going to do, and then you did it. That's uh, terrific. Most people are on the call because they want to talk about tax lien certificates and tax deeds, and you're certainly an expert at that. As a matter of fact, I always tell uh, people that in our seminars that you know so much more about buying open land and rangeland and forest and whatever that I've never even uh, gotten near that part of it. My part has always been the expertise of buying tax defaulted property for a low price and selling it for a little higher than that. And you have a, a lot more expertise at that. So let's start off by, why don't you just tell us about maybe like a small deal you did and maybe a big deal you did so people have some idea of the scope of your knowledge in this business. 
I guess we can start with a, a property that I just had a closing on about a week ago. And oh. it's fairly typical of the small deals that I do. This was vacant land and it was about five and a half acres. Uh -huh. And and so I have discovered that I can be pretty competitive on those small parcels of land when I go to tax deed sales. And with my forestry background, it's easy for me to find those properties and have a good idea of what their value is. So this was a fairly typical one, maybe a little bit atypical in that I was able to pick it up for opening bid at the tax sale, wow. which was less than $2,000. And when you can buy that cheap, that gives you a whole lot of room to play with. And you can also be a lot more flexible in your selling price. So on this one, when it was all said and done, I had about $7,000 in it. And the assessed value was a little over 28000 wow. So I, the way I marketed was real simple. I put a, an ad on Craigslist with plenty of pictures and I, put up a for sale sign that had one of those info tubes with flyers in it. Really? And, and then I laminated one of the flyer. This is a little trick of the trade folks but pay attention to this one because how many times have you gone to a real estate sign where there was an info tube or an info box and there weren't any flyers in it. So one thing I do is I'll go to the FedEx store where they have a laminating machine I'll laminate one of those flyers and I'll tape it to the for sale sign. And that way, if all the flyers are gone, uh, and that's exactly what happened on this one, that property was about 50 miles from home. And somebody called me up and he said, there aren't any flyers in a tube. And I said, walk around to the other side of the, the sign. There should be a, a flyer taped there. And sure enough, there was. And, oh. and so just little things like that sometimes can make the difference between finding sure. a buyer and not finding one. I was offering it for sale for uh, $5,000 less than the assessed value. I always try to sell it for, for less than assessed value. That's always something I put on the flyer. And Thanks. so I said assessed value 28,300 will sell for 233. Wow. And of course I had, I only had seven in it, so I had room right. to play. Right. And so this young couple, I think their father lived nearby and they were wanting to, to build close to, to, the family, they ended up offering me 20,000 and they wanted financing. And so oh. if you add up all the interest, they'll end up paying me, I'll still get $23,000 out of the deal. And remember, I only paid seven for it. So okay. this, that's a fairly typical small deal that I do. Oh boy. Now, do you do that in, and I'll come back and talk about the deal. Do you do that like in your IRA? Almost always. There are times when I'm short on funds in the IRA or I don't have immediate access to getting checks or something like that. And I will purchase through an LLC, but I much rather purchase through the Roth IRA because then any gains I get will not be taxed. Wow. Yeah, and right. that's, a, that's a really powerful thing. So sure here if I make 13000 or $15,000 off that deal, compare what your net would be if you had to pay tax on it versus taking all of that money and going on to the next deal. Yeah, no, I didn't write all those numbers down, but it seemed to me you pretty much double your money and that, that investment. And if it's uh, residential or rural land, doesn't require any management, right? And, and that's another thing because I still practice my forestry trade. And part of that involves going across the country in, in, the, in the summers and working in the Pacific Northwest. And so it's a lot easier to run off and leave a piece of land for three or four months than it is to leave a house. So I'm just. Oh, that's for sure. Happen. That's for sure. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen. House people could break into it. They could damage it. There's all kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, so that really worked. So a typical deal, you did say, I think I interpreted it anyway. Uh, you said you bought it for about 2000 So there's some other costs. Was that like taxes or what was that? And taxes were about $400 a year. And then I also did a quiet title in order to, to oh. obtain marketable title to the property. And that cost me, I think it was $3,600. Okay. And now tell us what that quiet title is. Could you do that? Sure. Uh, what the quiet title does is that, okay, after you've um, purchased a property, especially in the state of Georgia, where there's a, a right of redemption, 
you have to foreclose that. And even if you foreclose that, the, the title insurance companies are still hesitant to insure a transaction like that. <clears throat> so you go to sell it to somebody else and the title insurance company says, no, it's had a tax deed in, in its history. We're going to run for the hills. We're not going to cover it. Okay. But, but if you go to the courts and you have an attorney do it, you don't do it yourself. And the, the attorney does the quiet title. So he presents all that information to a judge Anyone who might possibly have an interest in that property gets notified and they have the opportunity to present their case to the judge. Uh, the reality is that uh, usually nobody shows up. And so you have an uncontested case. Eventually you get a, a, an order from the judge and that order states that you and you alone now have the sole possession of that property and any other claims that might exist have hereby been extinguished. So now you have marketable title to that property. You can go out and find a buyer. And so at that closing we had recently on that $20,000 deal, there were no problems at all with me selling it to the next person. There were no questions at all about the tax deed history of that property because there was that judge's final decree. One of the ways I know you mentioned in your, as we opened, you said, and you make financing available. Now, I know that America buys cars and houses with financing. Now you're talking about buying uh, properties like these with financing. Can you tell me how you do that? Sure. Uh, well, for starters, it's my understanding that it's pretty hard to get financing on a piece of land through a bank. They'll let you build a house on a small parcel and they'll fin finance it that way. But if you just say, hey, I've got 15 acres of land that I'm, I want to buy and I want to uh, borrow money from the bank of whatever, it's pretty hard to do that. So I, I try to fill that gap that the banks leave open and I don't do my service for free. I usually charge around 8% interest, which in today's market sounds a little bit high, but almost no one ever flinches at that 8% because really? I'm giving them something that nobody else is going to give, which is financing. And I even try to be flexible in how much down they put and what their monthly payments are based on their ability to pay because my goal is really for them to actually own the property rather for them to get half partway through the payments and end up defaulting on it and losing it. I could make money off of that by selling it to somebody else and starting over, but I'd rather see that first buyer go all the way through. And so I set the terms. I'll ask the people, hey, can you afford 200 a month, 300 a month, 400 a month? What, you, what can you afford? And they give me an answer and then I just uh, have a sample amortization table that's in a spreadsheet and I just fill in the, the blanks and come up with the, the, the number of months that will take to pay off that, that debt. And I say, okay, that'll take you seven years if you want to pay $300 a month. Wow. And, and, and so it's, it's that kind of thing. Instead of just me saying, no, I have to be paid off in four years and you have to pay me $550 a month. Once again, if you do that, you're limiting your pool of buyers. My goodness, you're, uh, you're quite the marketer. You, you didn't just get in the tax lien and deed business. You got in the finance and marketing business. That's pretty good. Well, uh, Ted Thomas is a big marketing guy, <laughs> and, and he pounds it over your head that you have to be a marketer. <laughs> oh. and, and, and the truth is, if you don't market, you end up accumulating all these properties and having to pay tax on them. And maybe in a really hot market, that's fine if it's going up 10, 20, 30% per year. But in my market, it's not doing that. So I make money by flipping them right. and uh, getting the, the cash back. And, but I'm willing, I have enough cash in my IRA that I am willing to take some of it in slowly because once you get it going, it's a money machine that every month there's people sending you money. Nice. And, and the nice. money piles up. And then yeah. as you, after you accumulate a certain pile of it, then you can go out and take that money and go to another tax sale with it. You're pretty benevolent. You're a benevolent seller. You're making, you're accommodating these people. And isn't that the way to make money at the low, lower level here? Meaning lower level under a couple of hundred thousand. There's a lot of number one, I'm going to call it product, but a lot of tax defaulted properties available, which you can buy at a good price. And then you can not only mark them up and make a profit, but you can make a profit while they're paying you off. What's wrong with that? That's, that's good money. Yeah. Well, yes. And, and if you consider that how many other people are out there who paid closer to retail for their piece of land 
who have it listed with the real estate agent and they're trying to get cash because they need all the money. So I can go around those people and, and the, the potential buyers, you know, they look at several parcels and everybody's wanting cash and they come to mine and, Hey, I'll take 3000 down, 5,000 down. I'll let you finance it for 10, for 10 years. Nice, nice. I, I get a lot of buyers that way. Of course you open up a whole new market for yourself. Absolutely. Uh, I always tell people Georgia is my favorite state, but I tell them it's my favorite state because uh, on a tax deed uh, certificate, you can get uh, 20% in the first year and 30 in the second year, but you've taken this to another level. Tell me about the, uh, the state. Is there how many counties there might be? How many auctions there might be? How many third one, not to ask you too many at once. Uh, how many properties would be a rural property as against a city property in a state like that? Uh, there are, I, I believe there's 159 counties in the state. So there are lots and lots of counties to choose from. And so you have quite a few of them that are urban. You, you have the whole cluster of counties surrounding the Atlanta area. And then you have uh, Columbus and Augusta and Savannah and Athens. So you, you, you have those urban areas, but then the numerous rural counties. The mix of properties as to whether their land or houses is going to be really dependent on which county you're in. And so the built up counties, most of the tax sales will not sh have much land at all. And what land is there is usually building lots. Whereas the rural counties will have the larger undeveloped parcels that are not building lots and subdivisions. They might be a, a, just a, a three acre lot out in the country. Frequently you'll find property that maybe it had a mobile home on it and the mobile home was repossessed. And so now you just have a vacant piece of land that has well and septic on it. And, that, and so I try to, to pick up parcels like that. Uh, I'm doing all that during my research and I try to pick the ones that are the most marketable ones so that I have fewer problems down the road. And that, that way, when I do get possession of it, I've gone through the expense of doing the quiet title and the foreclosure that I can put that for sale sign up there and, and actually get people who call me and say that they do want that land. So you actually do a limited amount of work uh, ahead of time. You start out by really investigating and then you figure out how you're going to sell it. And then you, then you go about this whole process. So you, you have quite a few steps here. And it's the voice of experience too. You've been down, down the same road with some properties and right. that some sell a lot more easily than others. And so early on, I was buying more of those low end properties and the ones back off the road because I, I was at the very first, I was just enamored of the fact that I could go out there and buy pieces of land. Yeah. And that's something I'd never done before in my life. All right. Tell me about, I know there's no one answer to this. There's a perception and I've heard a lot of people say, oh, there was 400 people at that auction. I was scared to death. I wouldn't even be able to get any consideration. So can you talk a little bit about what at those auctions? I don't expect there's going to be 400 people, but you get my point. There's going to be all different sizes and shapes, but to talk a little bit about that if you would. Uh, some of the auctions I've been to have had 400 people, but those tend to be in big cities, say like Tulsa, Oklahoma, one of the buying tours we had last year. Mm -hmm. There were, I think there were 400 registered bidders, but more typically the auctions that I go to in Georgia will have, you know, 20 to 50 people. And in that group, and you hear this all over and over from people who, not just me, but, and, and not just from Ted, but new students who go to their first auction and they get their impressions of what's the crowd like. You always have some people who don't bid at all. You almost always have a, a group of people who are interested in one property and one property only. It might be the piece of land or the house next door to them. And in a lot of cases, it's the first time they've ever been to a tax sale. And then you'll usually have some local people who frequently attend tax sales. And so they've got their own objectives and their own types of properties that they look after. You got folks like me who come from a few counties away. Uh, even though I usually buy land, I, I'm an equal opportunity buyer. And if I see a house <laughs> that I'm interested in, you bet I'm going to put a bid on that thing until I get outbid. My experience was uh, 20, 30 percent at the most were, the, were bidders. The rest were observers. Uh, but the, the bidders were a unique category. And like you said, there's always uh, one group at the uh, auction 
that really is there for that one property. And that's me and you trying to get that property next door to us every time because we know the value of it. Okay, that's really interesting. How many auctions would you say you've been to over the years? Oh, a few hundred because in the state of Georgia, about the maximum number of auctions you could attend would be 12 because they, they have an auction the first Tuesday of every month. January is usually really slow, and so there's some years I don't get to go in January. This is right after the Christmas holidays, and, and usually there's only one or two or three counties in the whole state ho holding an auction. And then when I'm traveling out west, I miss it. So I, I'm usually going to maybe eight auctions a year in the state of Georgia. Every once in a while, I can pick up an auction in another state, so maybe eight or ten auctions a year. And I've been doing this for 20 years. So yeah, probably wow. close to 200 auctions that I've done. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. I won't even ask you how that IRA is doing. I, I've already figured that out. It's doing pretty darn good. You know? it, it, it's doing okay, it's, yeah. considering that it started from pr uh, pretty close to zero. Yeah. Yeah. You worked at it all the way. Uh, you've done a lot. So I'm proud of you and I'm sure you're feeling good about yourself. And give me some, I'm going to run out of time here in about two or three minutes, but don't, don't feel hurried in, anyway. But give me two or three tips uh, what I should do at an auction and uh, what I shouldn't do at an auction. Uh, the very first thing is you must do good research. And if you have not done good research, just don't show up. Or if you've only gone through half of the properties on the list, only bid on those properties that you know and understand. And, and don't just take a, a shot at one and say, oh, gee, these people are really bidding on this one. It must really be good. You know, they they might have a totally different purpose for bidding on that property. And a good example of that was the most recent auction that I was at that was part of the, our most recent buying tour is that there was a, a building lot in a gated community where the houses around it were of in the $300,000 range. Wow. Uh, so, so it's one of these rural golf communities where everything you do costs money. Right. And one of the students had called the a realtor who is like the primary realtor within that development and talked to her about that lot and another one that was up at the tax sale. And how much do you think we would be able to sell it for? And, and she said, probably, I think she said something in the neighborhood of $25,000. And you know, there's $1,000 a year homeowner association due. There is other fees and there is even $13,000 in back homeowner association dues in that property, wow. which you probably wouldn't have to pay, but there's some gray areas in the Georgia law, so you might end up having to fight the homeowners association over that. But anyway, when the bidding came up on that, people were just bidding in $100 increments, and it got up to about $5,000, and then one guy in the back of the crowd shouted out 20000 No way. Yeah, that sounds like a crazy thing to do, but he was a builder. Oh. And he, he was going to put a house on, he was going to put a $300,000 house on that thing. And so oh. he didn't care about that, that $1,000 a year homeowner association fee. Right. So he had totally different objectives right. than everybody else there. And he was, he just wanted to get that lot and move on. He didn't want to be bidding against people in $100 increments. Hmm. That's the guy you and I like to sell to. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's who we're already looking for. <laughs> Make a friend right away, right? Exactly. Yeah. Oh my goodness. All right. Each sale is different and we'll talk more about that. I've run out of time for this call. I want to invite you back for other calls, but uh, you sure do a tremendous job of explaining uh, the real world of how this business works. And very few people have your experience. So I'm truly grateful that you'd come on the call and help uh, other people learn about this. And I will call you back and have you on uh, very soon. So thank you again. Yeah, my pleasure, Ted. Folks, I'm going to transition now from hearing Ted Thomas. And I have a wonderful guest today. His name is Brian Fouts, and that's F-O-U-T-S. And this is something terrific, okay? He calls his company the Elevation Group, and listen to this. He has the fastest growing financial education company on the planet. Now think about that. He's helped over 50,000 people get started since 2010. So I'm really honored to have you along today, Brian. So let's just start right out and tell us where you are and what you do, and let's have some fun for 30 minutes and see if we can educate my clients a little bit. I appreciate that, Ted. Thank you for so much for uh, having me here. And uh, yeah, as you said, my business is the Elevation Group, or we call it EVG for short. And uh, we've ha helped over 50,000 people create financial you know, freedom and abundance in their lives since 2010. 
And what we do is we bring the wealth strategies, the investing strategies of the ultra rich to our members and share with them those methods and ways of investing that are not familiar or taught to the, on the traditional path through life. And so that's what we do is we actually have a board of advisors inside of our membership platform that teach these unique strategies of the ultra rich to the world. Wow, gee, that's this is uh, something that's kind of unheard of. Now, do you have a membership site? How would anybody ever discover you? This is amazing. Yes, yeah, so we have a unique membership site. It's called our EVG Insiders Club, where we actually bring everybody inside and we share that this information with our board of advisors. And we have a bunch of cool stuff inside there that we do for our members. We have live events every month. We are always bringing on new advisors, new opportunities to invest. And it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of great stuff inside there. And our members love it. And then, of course, uh, we show them how to invest and how to build wealth in their lives and really have that life that we all dream of. But so very few of us can actually ever achieve because we don't have access to the right information and, and so that's what we're all about. And that's my, my journey, my passion in life is to really help people achieve this in their life because it's not easy to do. It's not out there. And people don't talk about this stuff. They don't teach this stuff on that traditional path, which is actually exactly how I got my start. I didn't start with a bunch of money or a, as an investor like this. Oh, now I want to talk about that for a second. My audience is, I attract some old timers and you young gunslingers, you do things like say that the EVG group and oh my God, what is the EVG? I, I'm clear back at the EVG group. What does that mean? So the Elevation Group. So oh, the Elevation Group. Okay, I got it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we call it EVG for short because it's a mouthful. Of course, of course. You're one of those internet marketers. Those internet guys are, go are going so damn fast. I have to run to catch up with you. You're just walking and I'm running. So I'm going to stop you from time to time. And my audience is going to love this interview and I know it because you're going to get two hours in this 30 minutes. I got it. So tell me about your passion. I love to hear this. Yeah, so my passion is really understanding how real wealth is created because I started out the traditional path of go to school, get a job, be a good employee, right? Save into a 401k and hope to live the good life someday down the road. And that's how I got my start. And I got into debt and I started working for an, an employer and years went by and I thought I was doing everything I was supposed to be doing. I had that, call it that American dream checklist all checked off. I had the house with the mortgage. I had the kids and the white picket fence, all that stuff. And Something happened eventually though, 2008 happened, of course, we all remember that. And I, I remember seeing wealth just wiped out. Nobody had control of their future, of their wealth, of what they were doing. And I realized that's a huge deal. And then like one time I remember my boss, he, I was gonna go on vacation with my family and my boss told me to cancel my vacation because you, there's a project you have to be on. And I realized, oh my gosh, you gotta be kidding me. My, I, I don't even control my own time. So therefore I don't even control my own life. And that was a big impact for me. And then right around that time, I also, I read this article in a magazine about your net worth, right? What is your net worth? Every successful investor knows their net worth. Most people don't. I'm like, crap, I don't know my net worth either. So I said, I might as well find out what it is. Yeah. So I did the math, right? All your liabilities, all your assets. And I was worth a negative amount of money. Uh -oh. I've been working 10 years and I was worth negative amount of money. I couldn't believe it. It was, what the hell am I doing? What is this path that I'm on? Why am I even doing this? What's this for? Because I, my, I'm, and I realized that every year thereafter, I'd be getting further and further into debt because my expenses were going up. Having wow. kids, right? All that stuff, expenses going up. And I realized I have to do something different if I want something different in my life. And so that started a journey for myself and also my brother, uh, we did it together. And that journey was to find out how to invest like the wealthy. How do the 1% successful investors and entrepreneurs, how do they really build wealth? What are they doing differently than everybody else? And that is a journey that I've been on for, for over eight years now, and I'm, I'm on it today, and I'm going to be on it you know, for the rest of my life because I love this stuff. I love learning these things. And ultimately, I found out that I love teaching this stuff and helping other people do the exact same thing because I went from what I call money mayhem, not having a positive net worth, to being completely financially independent to, I, I, actually, at one point, I was over almost half a million dollars in debt and then oh I went from goodness. to oh you know, having a net worth of millions of dollars in just under four years by learning these strategies. But, and I did it by following successful investors, by getting into their groups and their masterminds and sneaking in and finding out what they were doing and then implementing that in my life and learning these strategies and these methods. And then now we teach that stuff and we review what we have learned inside the Elevation Group for our members. Yeah. yeah. And now you say we, and we, you must include your brother. Is that your brother? You and your brother? Yes. My brother, Jake, he's my best friend. He's also my business partner. We do this stuff together. He, we have multiple businesses now. And so he runs a couple of those and I, I mainly run the Elevation Group. I and see. so that's a lot of fun. And we, uh -huh. we love sharing this stuff and yeah. we're always learning new things. Yeah. And so, and something I've learned when you look at wealthy individuals and, and investors and what I've learned is that 
this is a very, it's a different path. And yeah. it's a, it's a fun path. It's a blast to be doing this because you get to do a lot of fun things, but ultimately you get control of your life. You get control of your wealth and also your future. And there's some three, there's a, a few key ingredients that I've learned along the, this journey that I, I'd love to share with you guys here. Oh, and I please. know you said you, yeah, you're, you're please. Uh, aware please uh, I'd love to have uh, you share some of those things. Uh, but uh, just just inject a little something there about your brother. I know he's a special person, and and I do, I want to recognize him just for that uh, thirty seconds on the podcast. But I know he does something special. Could you tell people just about that? Yeah. So my brother Jake, he actually started out in the same career as I did, which is what we were. I was a, I was a, in construction, so I did construction oh, work, I and see. he didn't like it, and uh, I didn't lie, but he decided to make a change to something that he had some passion around, which was becoming a firefighter. And so he actually became a firefighter and he's now also an entrepreneur and an investor, but he does, he's still a firefighter to this day because he loves that job and he loves what it stands for. And he loves helping out the community and helping out other people, which is, it's just, it's beautiful that he loves doing that. And then I'm now a full-time entrepreneur. So we both essentially escaped. I call it we retire. We both retired from what we did not like to something that we're passionate about. And that's really Uh, something I've learned on this path is there's no retirement and when you get into the world of the wealthy and successful investors and entrepreneurs there's no such thing as retirement because who wants to retire from something they love doing i'm your big advocate here just to interrupt you for a second i'm I'm 80 years old on my next birthday and i love going to work every day i drive everybody else nuts but i love going to work every day and i'm going to keep doing it and everybody in my family passed away when they were 60 in a couple of it a couple of years and so i'm having a great time and i'm healthy and i'm making money and like you said when you're making money and you can help other people what what else is there to do? I guess I could have six more kids, but I don't have any kids. So I'm just going to help people make money. Let's get back to you. Tell us about these wonderful ways that you So one changed. of them was what I just shared was that whole mindset around wealth and, and what we're doing in our lives. And because I always had this idea of, hey, I'm going to go work for 30 years and then I'm going to retire. And I realized that for most people, and so I actually had a grandfather who, same thing, he went and worked for 40 plus years and he went to go retire. And he was going to go travel the state in a motorhome that he and my grandma bought to go watch his grandkids' uh, sporting events. And so what happened was, though, is basically two years after he retired, he got sick. He got basically leukemia. He had to go on dialysis. Then he got oh. aggressive Parkinson's disease, and then he died. Oh. And I remember that was a huge turning point for me. And it said, do something different and start now because do you want to live your life later on or do you want to live it now? Now. And so that kind of started my journey. And, and through that journey, what I realized is there's no such thing as retirement. I'm not going to stop doing this stuff because I love what I'm doing. And that's a very different kind of mindset and focus than everybody else. Everybody else is saying, I need to have enough money to retire, which means I need to have enough money to stop doing what I'm doing right now and do something else. I want to do that something else right now, not later on. And so wow. that's what I love helping people do is to realize that. How do you do what you want to do right now, not 20, 30 years from now? Do it now. And have fun doing it and build wealth and help other people. And that's a mindset that I, I, I had to change in myself because when I got around successful investors and wealthy individuals, and that's what I do on a daily basis, I'm always around really successful people um, who are helping other people. I realized that is something that they, they don't retire. They don't stop doing what they're doing. They're always building something else. They're always having a lot of fun doing things and experiencing life fully. And I realized back when I had a job, a nine to five job, I was not experiencing life fully. I was right, not. right, right. And, wow. and there's always going to be ups and downs in that whole journey. But that's something that I'm very passionate about is helping people realize that. And when you do and you make that switch in your mind, uh, incredible things happen. Incredible yeah. things. Happen. Yeah. So mindset was number one. Now, did you have special training? Did you go to school for that? Or did you get some special books or white papers? Or how did you make that change? Yeah, I had some special training. It was called the School of Hard Knocks. <laughs> <laughs> the School um, of Hard Knocks. Oh, I love this. Yeah, oh, I, oh, I, I, I did not. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I did not have that uh, training oh. on that. So I started becoming an investor. I still had a, re- a regular job. I, was still, I started becoming an investor. And I had some huge blows. Oh. At one point, we lost some investments and money to, to a, a, call it a nefarious individual. Oh. And I had to learn these lessons the hard way. And the one thing that I learned at that point when you're going through some of those trials and tribulations, as I call them, is mindset. Mindset is what will bring you out the other side. And so I had to learn that stuff on my own. But eventually I did learn, hey, you have a network. You have people you're around right now. Reach out to them. And so I started doing that and started learning how other people really think about money and wealth and how they leverage that. And so inside our membership elevation group, our membership, the first module that we do is all about wealth mindset. It's all about how to have that focus and how to have the understanding of how money really works. And one of the first things that I learned on that when I was in that phase 
was the sources of income and how to really understand how they work and how they can help help you out. And I'll share this and I share it in some of our webinars too. I share Please. this, but it's yeah. the three sources of income. And I, you know, Ted, I'm, I'm sure you know what they are. And most people have heard about them, but the lesson that I learned around these though is, is what's your strategy around them? Now, the three sources of income, the first one is called active income. We all know what that is, right? That's when you're actively trading time for money. Right. And that's when you have a job. And now we all start out usually with active income. There's nothing wrong with that. And most people have a type of active income throughout their life. There's nothing wrong with it. But unfortunately, most people spend 99% of their time only in active income. That's what they focus on. That's the traditional path in through life, right? Go to school, get a job, focus on active income and trade time for money. Now, why do most people do that though? Think about that. You're trading something of value for money. What is that thing you're trading? You're trading time, right? Ted, Ted, yeah. Time is valuable. Oh, it is boy. so oh, valuable. Yeah. And, and people will, will pay you a lot of money for that value. And so they'll pay you money for that time. And the reason why is because we all have that thing. We all have time. We all have that valuable asset. And yet we give it away so freely. We don't truly appreciate how valuable time is. But that's the first source of income, which is active income. And if you're a, an, an employee, if you're a business owner, you understand what that is. You're trading time for money. The second source of income, though, is portfolio income. Now, portfolio income is something like a 401k, stocks, non-dividend paying bonds, those kinds of things. And I always ask the question, how do you get income, though, from a portfolio? And most people say, oh, you get dividends or something like that. Ted, what would you say? How do you get income from a portfolio, though? Yeah, when I say that, I say I own tax lien certificates and they produce 18 and 20% in, so they get interest income or I buy tax defaulted property and they have a generous upside because I'm buying for 10 and 20 cents on the dollar. So I have two possible income sources there. Now, do you consider those to be an asset or a part of a portfolio? I guess you have assets inside a portfolio. Right. But yeah. in my kind of situation, what I look at is a, a portfolio has assets that you have to sell to get the income. Right. So think of stocks. You have to sell your stocks like a 401k to get the income. Right. And what that means is you have a portfolio that is shrinking over time yeah, because you're liquidating that asset to get the income. Right. And so think about the traditional path through life, right? You go to school, you get a job, you make money, you put a portion of that money into a portfolio. And then later on in life, you stop active income. It goes away. And then you rely 100% upon portfolio to provide you with income. Right. That is a very scary concept to most people because they realize that if the market tr crashes or changes, your portfolio can go down in value. Right. And so right. it's a huge risk. And then the third source of income that we all know and love and it's the holy grail is passive income. Right. That's more where you have assets that provide you with income or cash flow. Call it real estate, call it certain types of obviously tax strategies, and that's passive income. That's where we all want to end up. And what I realize is that successful investors, wealthy entrepreneurs, they understand the three sources of income and they're focused on actually leveraging all three of them right. and moving their money, moving their capital, that fuel from the first one, active income through portfolio and into passive. And the average investor does not do that. The average person does not do that. They don't move their money through one. They take it for granted that it will be there later on in life. And so that's something I learned really early on. And I learned that you have to have a strategy around that to under and understand how you're going to move money through these ones and leverage the assets into uh, passive and portfolio versus just focusing on active income. Right. And so okay. that's just, that's something we talk about inside the membership. We, we talk about strategies to do that. And we also inside there, we actually have investment opportunities for members. They can invest in to get more passive cash flow, things like that. Yeah. Wow. And tell me a little bit about this elevation group in the sense it was, it, it's created to help people learn all the different sources. It's, it's got more than one objective. So can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So Inside there, we have about basically six modules of the main course, which is, we call it our millionaire maker. And inside there, we talk about obviously the mindset, the how to think about wealth. Then we actually show people how to create cash flow. So we have strategies in there by guys like Ken McElroy, who's obviously a rich dad advisor, how to create cash flow in your life, whether it's through starting a business, a side business, doing tax lien strategies with, with you, other ways to create more income in your life. So cash flow. Then we show people how to take that cash flow and put it to work for you. So how do you get $1 working for you to, to turn it into a dollar fifty and $2? How do you do that? And so we have some advanced strategies inside there. How to become your own bank is one of the more popular ones, which is um, using a, a specific strategy and account to essentially become your own bank. Then we show people how to uh, create their own home, own businesses. 
So because owning a business, by the way, is 99% of every successful investor has their own business. So at some point you're going to want to have one. So we show people how to do that. Then we show people how to protect their assets. So how to keep more of what you make through tax strategies, asset protection. Then we actually have opportunities to invest for passive income. So we show, we show people how to invest passively and get cash flow. And then we talk about how to pass wealth on through legacy planning. And that's, you know, generational wealth. And so these are all the steps. These are the path that successful investors go through to create real wealth in your life. And so we have advisors in all these areas that teach different strategies that our members can go and learn from. But not only that, something we do that's very unique is that we actually will let our members work with our advisors. So these are, this is my network, by the way. It's my personal network. We have dozens of people in it. And then as our members come on and they want to do something, like whether it's doing something with an IRA or investing in a certain strategy, we actually make a one-on-one -on -one introduction to our advisors for that member. So they can go wow. work with them. Wow, that's, that's, that's personal. Really that's unique and nice. Now, let me, let me explain something that I found and maybe you found the answer. What I found is I have a, my clients tend to be a little on the older side. I jokingly say 45 to 105, but I, I really do have a, a lot of people that took the path that you uh, mentioned earlier, which was very traditional work, uh, save some money, get it in IRA. And, and now they're at that point where they have an IRA and uh, they're doing okay because we, we try to put them in a passive investment, which is tax lien certificates. And so uh, that's a little self-serving for me. However, I noticed that there's a lot of these people that even though they're, they might have decided to retire early at 45 and 50, they would really like to have a, a little business. So when you direct people in that, what kind of little businesses or even big businesses do you refer to them to? Do you have any, any recommendations that are things that are working for the future that don't require 200 employees, but could be done maybe even at home or with a small group of helpers or anything like that? Yeah. So we actually, so one of our partners, one of our advisors actually shows people how to buy existing businesses. Oh, so you want to buy an existing one, which is something I love to, I've done that before. So I like it. But if you oh. want to go buy an existing one, it's nice because w when you look at that strategy, you're buying something that's already been there. It's already established. So they've already got the startup costs going. They've already got the marketing in place. They've already got everything working. So you can go and buy it. And then the nice thing about buying an existing business is you already have the cash flow there too, which is obviously very nice. And yeah. a lot of times you can buy those with no money. You can use existing financing. With no money. Yeah. Are you serious? Oh my goodness. So. Yeah. So that's why. So a lot of people are very interested in doing that if uh -huh. you want to go that route. Otherwise, what I, we show people how to do is how to identify what kind of a business would you be passionate about? You have to do something that, you, that gets you excited. And so we have about five or six different strategies that we talk about that are mainly online, can be done from home. And so we have advisors that talk about different ways, different strategies inside that space. So you can do them from home. And the other thing that I always talk about just you know, when I do uh, coaching is I ask somebody, I said, hey, what is your skill set? What are you better at than everybody else around you? Uh -huh. What is that thing that, that you do really well that you can do with your eyes closed that you also like doing? What is that thing? And most people don't even think about that and they don't realize what that could, what that is. And so we help people try to realize what that is. And then how do you monetize that? How do you provide value? Because when it comes to business, the way you have a successful business that is profitable is you provide value. You provide uh -huh. value to people by solving something, by solving the pain or bringing them that, that thing that they want. And that is really what it's all about. It's not about, hey, this widget is so cool. Who cares if the widget is cool if nobody wants it? If it doesn't help anybody, it's not, this, this doesn't matter, right? So what is that thing you can do that helps other people give them value? And then the matter, then it's, just easy. then it's easy, I guess I would say. And so we help people go through that and learn what they can do from home as, a, as an entrepreneur. Because typically in that space, when you're at that point in life and you want to have a side business, you're not looking to go create a $100 million business, a supplement, a side income, have fun doing it. And so that's what I get excited about it because there's so many different ways to do that. We've had members that have learned a strategy and then three months later, they're like, hey, I just made, I just did $6,000 in the last two, two weeks. This is incredible. And so oh. there's so many different ways to do that kind of stuff and right. out there. And, right. But the problem is there's hundreds of things out there to do. There's okay, so let, let me stop you on this for a second because this is a wonderful thing that you're doing here. And so you actually, if they're, if they're a member, that they, they can come to you and you'll expose them to a lot of different things. So I like that. I noticed that, and you, of course, are an, are an expert in that area. I notice a lot of people work very hard for 30 or 40 years and they've saved their money. They don't know which way to turn. And I end up with them as a client because they, they want a passive investment and I recognize that. But for the ones that haven't lost their zest 
for life and excitement and everything, there are small business opportunities available. And so you're saying that these businesses are commonplace, that you can find these businesses, that you train them or send them in the right direction so they can find one that's good for them. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, essentially, we, what we do is we show them the strategies, give them some knowledge, because when it comes to having success in anything, you have, there's three things that I believe you have to have. First yeah. is knowledge. And yes, there's a lot of knowledge out there, but is it the right knowledge? So we're here at the Elevation Group, we're all about the right knowledge. Then it's all about belief. The second uh-huh. thing you have to have is the belief that you will be successful. With the right knowledge and the right access and the right mentors, you can, you, you'll have that belief. The third thing is action. You have to be able to take action and know what to do. A lot of people will say, hey, here's all this information, but what do you do? What's the next step? And so I'm always about, hey, here's the next thing you can do. Here's the next, here's your action steps. Nice. And so nice. my big passion is giving people those three things, yeah. knowledge, belief, and action so they can have success. And so, yeah, so we actually show people different strategies out there because we go and we, I, I'm exposed to so many different opportunities all the time, but a lot of them are, a lot of them are garbage. I just, they just are. And right. so what we do is we find the best ones and we bring those to our members nice. and say, hey guys, out of these 100 different strategies out there, here's the five that are legit, that have results that either I have done or we have members doing them or we have partners that are doing these things and they're having success. And then we show them what they are. Wow. Now, I'm always uh, worried about time. So we have, a, we have about five or six minutes left. So I want to make sure and ask you this question because I know it'll come up. And when we first started, you said one of the things that your group specializes in is you help people with tax strategies. Not that you're a tax advisor, but you have other advisors within your group that help them with that. Can you t- talk a little bit about that for a minute or so? Yes, yeah, so we have advisors in all different arenas. So real estate, tax strategies, asset protection, businesses, even credit, credit score strategies and mindset right. stuff. And so we bring in the best of the best because I'm not going to come up here, like you just said, Ted, I'm not the expert in all these things. I'm not going to go up here and say, hey, here's how to do X one through 10. I'm going to go find the best of the best in each area and bring them to our members. That is what we do here. That is what is so unique is we find the best people. So right. like tax strategies, we have a very good tax strategist guy who comes on and talks about different strategies all the way from, hey, if you're an employee, all the way through, if you're a business owner, what are the best strategies that most people don't even know about? Because uh-huh. it's, it's, it's not about talking about the mainstream strategies. It's about, hey, here's the little known undiscovered strategies of the ultra rich that they use that anybody can use, by the way. And giving the access to those types of uh, opportunities, that is what makes this so different. And that's what people like this because wealthy individuals do things differently. I do things differently. And all of our members can do the exact same thing when they have this kind of access. That's how this works. If you want to get the same results as everybody else around you, go to the mainstream, you know, tax guy down the road in the strip mall and he'll give you the same advice he gives, you know, to hundreds of other people. Right. I do not want that advice though. That advice to me is garbage. It, it, it is going to lead you somewhere that you don't want to go usually. And if you want to have that life, that fulfilled life and have abundance, you've got to look, you've got to look somewhere else. You've got to do something different. Right. And that's what we're all about is what is that different thing that you can do? We certainly have an example to follow. That guy, Jeff Bezos, I, I really admire yeah. him. Look what he did with, the, with that company. And he, I'm sure he has a whole staff of people that are just looking for all the ways he can save money on taxes so he can build his business bigger. But for the little guy, you and I, we're the average kind of people. Now they can look at these strategies with taxes that can, I think the only way you're going to make money in America today is be a Jeff Bezos or the guy that started Apple, Stephen Jobs and those people. But how many geniuses do we have? But you certainly can make money if you have a small business, even if it's a barbershop and you run it right and using their tax strategies are so important okay you have a big membership i interrupted you there so sorry to step on your words but you have a big membership you have taught thousands of people what do people gravitate to what are they what what kind of people are attracted to your to to be a being a member a lot of our members are individuals that are in like the nine to five they have that job they, they have a 401k yet they really don't have that financial like abundance or freedom that you really want in life. And that was, that's where I got my start, by the way. I was, in a, I was working construction and I could pay the bills, but that was about it. And I really was not getting ahead. And I knew that there was so much more available out there. I knew there was so much more that I could do with my life and so much more wealth that was out there. And so that was how I got my start. And so we really help individuals that are in that kind of space that are, they want to escape the rat race. But we also help a lot of people that are, they're later on in life, they've been working, maybe they have some capital built up or they're in that kind of retirement phase but they want to do something different. They know that there's so much more opportunity out there and they're looking for that access, that opportunity to invest or learn how to invest. And so we have a huge chunk of our membership is, is in that space right there where they want to do something different. 
They don't want to just go sit on the couch and watch TV. They actually want to do something with their life, help give back and create real wealth. So we have a lot of people that are doing that as well. And then we have a lot of people that are just investors that want to learn more about investing. They, maybe they're in real estate and they say, hey, this is great. I'm in real estate, but I know there's other strategies out there. I know there's other things that I can do. And so they're looking for access to that information and that knowledge. And so that's the three main groups that we see a lot that come to EVG oh, and really are excited about what we do here. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Now, I'm down to just a couple of minutes left, so I want to ask you a couple of personal questions and I hope you'll, so you could share it with people. I know you're a young man. I want to ask you, how did you get to be so successful so quickly, so young? I would say it was my just my desire to actually have something different in my life, to oh. really live that life of abundance. And But mainly it was understanding that I, I was very fortunate to understand this on my own early on in life, that there's three things you have to have. It's knowledge. And I said it already before it's knowledge, it's belief and it's action. And action is probably the biggest one out there is just taking consistent action every single day towards that thing that you want to have in your life. Most people will not do that. They, you can give them all the information that you want, but unless you take consistent action towards what you want, you're all, you're going to be in the same place you are, Today, one year from now, two years from now, five years from now, you will not go anywhere if you don't take consistent action. And so I was able to be able to do that in my life. I took action consistently, even and sometimes you have some setbacks and you keep taking action, keep doing it, keep moving forward. And because of that, I was able to get into some very cool groups. I got invited to some very high level elite, um, call it clubs. And because I was always taking action, because people would talk to me and then I'd go do what they said. They'd give me advice, I'd go take action on it. And people saw that, they recognized wow. that. And so that opened up so many different doors for me and so many different opportunities. And, and so now I've had the success in my life and now I just, I, I'm able to share the exact same thing that I've been doing with others and have people join me on this journey. And that's what I love doing. I, I honestly, I, one of the biggest things I've been able to do is help other people. I've mentored and coached hundreds of people on these strategies helped other people have success and quit their jobs. And so I, that is what I get a kick out of. That's my big passion right there is helping people do that same thing. And that's one thing I learned early on though, as well, is that successful people have success in the first place because they want to give back, they want to give value and they want to help others. And when you help others, you'll help yourself as well. Yeah. Okay. Now we don't want to leave the impression that it's just a piece of cake to do this because we both know it's not a piece of cake, but you have to love what you're doing to do it. So I certainly agree with the, all, your, all your philosophy and strategy, but what does it take to grow one of these businesses? What it takes to grow any business, I believe is passion. You have to have the passion for it. It's that fuel that's actually going to get you up out of bed every single day yeah. and, and get to work on it. That's one of the biggest things is because you can, once again, you can give everybody the tools for a business, but unless they actually are excited about it and, and implement it, nothing's going to happen. Uh -huh. And so for everybody out there who's listening, the one thing I would just say is if you want to have success in any business you want to do, find something that you want to get out of bed for that you will, it doesn't matter what day of the week it is that you're going to go take action on it because you're excited about it. It, it gets you up, it gets you going and you want to do it. Like, I don't look forward to Friday nights and dread Monday mornings. I don't do that. I'm not in that space anymore. I cannot even fathom going back to that world. Wow. And if you have a business that is the same, that you dread getting up at Monday morning to go work on your business, that's the wrong business for you. Oh, thanks. Find something that you will just get super excited about to work on no matter what is going on. I talk to our members. I'll hop on the phone call with our members at nine o'clock at night just to talk about what they're doing and help them in their life because I love doing this. That is what gets me going. People are shocked that I'll call them up on a Sunday and mentor them and coach them. But wow. that's me. This is my business. This is what I do. It's why I'm successful doing this because I love doing this stuff. And wow. so when you're looking at these businesses, that's what, that's what it takes, guys. It takes that right there. And, and how are you going to use that passion to give value to others and help them in their lives as well? And that's what I love doing. And that's why I invite others on this journey with me and my brother and, my, and our EVG family. Oh, boy. I'm, I'm honored to, to work with you and to be able to interview you on, like we're doing today. Just your enthusiasm, it just comes right across the, on the audio. It's just absolutely incredible. So your enthusiasm is passing on to all of us. I want to thank you. You did a great uh, job of helping us. Do you have any final words you want to tell people on what they should look forward to or what they should do for the future? Do something now. <laughs> I'm like thinking it. right now. I like it. You're getting, I, I am, get yeah, it I'm, de I'm dead like, serious. Right, just every day, do something to move you forward to the life that you deserve. Okay. Not the one that you want, the one that you deserve. Take what's action your, every single day. What's your favorite book? 
My favorite book is The Obstacle is the Way. Really? Who was uh, that written by and what publisher? Uh, that is, I think, Brian Holiday. Wow. And it's a book that really helped me overcome obstacles because you're always going to have obstacles in your life. You're yeah. always going to have these things, but you can overcome them. And when you overcome them, amazing things happen. And so I, I strongly recommend that book. It was a great one. Yeah, Ryan Holiday, not Brian, Ryan Holiday. Tremendous interview. How exciting to uh, talk to you. It's a crack of dawn there in, in the West Coast. And so I'm so happy to have you. And congratulations on all your success. You certainly do deserve it all. And the name of your company that people could check in with you is? TheElevationGroup.com. Brian, thank you. You are tremendous. I look forward to seeing you in just a couple of weeks. Thank you, Ted. Appreciate it. Okay, bye-bye.